Welcome to another episode of HR and Payroll 2.0. I'm Pete Tiliakis, and as always, I'm joined by the legendary Julie Fernandez. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much, Pete. And we're blessed to have a guest this week, a very special guest. You want to introduce our guest for us, Julie? Here we are, for sure. I'd love to introduce Dave Polachek, um, someone that, uh, that I admire a great deal for his work in the HR space, and I'm excited to be able to have some conversation with him uh, today in the podcast and share that with him. Dave and I met working uh, when I was working for Goodyear. Um, and so oh, nice. he's been a practitioner forever. I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about himself, but uh, we spent a number of, a uh, couple of, a fair amount of time, a year or more, probably <laughs> working on some pretty big initiatives and uh, have been following him since. So um, Dave, why don't you introduce yeah, welcome, yourself? Dave. Welcome. Great. Yeah, thanks. Look forward to talking with you guys. Yeah, Julie and I met when we were getting ready to spend uh, some pretty big dollars for Goodyear on a whole new, you know, uh, payroll services technology strategy for uh, that's that's still in play today. So that was a big project that we did together. I look forward to chatting with you guys today. I'm a longtime HR guy, as, as Julie mentioned. I started out uh, on the shop floors of GE. I like to say I started out doing HR with steel toed shoes. <laughs> uh, all the FMLA tracking and employee discipline, union relations, all that stuff. And then also was kind of bouncing back and forth between manufacturing HR and headquarters, big project management stuff. So leading uh, for one of the business units in Oracle HR implementation and um, just got to do a whole lot of interesting projects over the years, followed GE people a couple of times. Um, again, implementing technology, managing operational vendors and doing a lot in the analytics space. Um, as that was sort of evolving within the, the HR function. And then for the last few years before joining Juliet Herring Palmer, I've been at uh, the Hackett Group doing um, similar to this advisory work, benchmarking work and other things, supporting HR leaders as they worked on their strategy, structure, analytics, dashboards, the whole bit. Yeah, good stuff. Well, it's good to have you, Dave. I know analytics has been something that I see a lot in my research. I know, Julie, it's, it's front of mind for folks out there. And, uh, you know, it's cool to hear your your background, Dave, you have a very, it sounds like a very uh, frontline manager experience that you can you can rely on here to uh, to draw upon in, in your work. So yeah, good stuff. And I take it you're both good year, Michigan? Yeah. Michigan for me. Michigan, yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. <Me too. laughs> very cool, very cool. We could talk about, we could talk about that offline, I guess. But um, yeah, look, so it's great to have you, Dave. I know you've recently written a blog about this very topic, right? Analytics and the barriers to it. So we're excited to, to dive into that a little bit later on. Um, so look, Julie, not much news this week to talk about. It's quiet time. Uh, the year just kicked off. Everyone's probably got their heads down preparing their roadmaps and budgets for the year. So not a lot to talk about on the vendor front. Yeah, very, very quiet. I agree. But Pete, maybe we should at least let folks know that uh, that you've kind of shifted direction a little bit very recently. So why don't you at least yeah. give a little bit of an idea? Yeah. Yeah. So as uh, maybe most of you have seen or heard by now, uh, I have made a, a return back to the analyst space uh, after a, a pause working for one of the vendors in the marketplace. I've, I've decided, you know, I, it's really where I belong. It's really where my heart is. And uh, it's what I feel like I should be doing, right? Helping the industry uh, advance itself and, and, and being a voice for that. Um, so I'm really excited to say that I am back as an independent analyst. Um, I already have some clients I'm working with. I'm very excited to be uh, working in and around at first here uh, in payments, payment services, uh, payroll, global EOR, even some HCM tech. I've already started doing some things with, so I'm really excited. It, it's been it's been fun so far this month, just getting getting back out there, getting reengaged, uh, and I've got some big announcements coming. Uh, another major announcement I'm going to make here, you know, within the next few weeks, probably by our next episode, and just a packed agenda for me personally. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to be doing a bunch of different little things around the industry. So, so look for that. So glad to be back. Excited. <laughs> awesome. Well, without any further ado, why don't we kind of move into the topic of analytics and yes. what I think was exciting about, um, about having Dave on in here and talking about the topic is specifically the angle of his blog, which is breaking the barriers to HR analytics. It seems like, you know, that holy grail that companies have been talking about getting to forever and ever and ever. And, and they're always bemoaning, you know, how they haven't gotten there and what they need to do to get there. And so, um, Dave, what inspired you to, you know, kind of take a crack at some of the biggest barriers and, and putting them out there for folks who are, who are in this perpetual situation? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, for me, it kind of bridges my work as a practitioner and then my work with so many different companies of 
of all sizes, especially a lot of the larger companies as it related to their analytics strategy. And what what I saw, first of all, is in my own career, there was so much we were able to do with just some very basic tools using Excel and other like simple visualizations to help move the needle on certain things. And what was interesting to me was getting in and into the consulting arena and working with so many large companies that were putting predictive analytics. So this is probably, say, go back five years. Everybody was saying predictive analytics is the thing. All HR leaders or so many that we were talking to were excited about it. And yet when you talk to them about, well, what are you trying to predict? The predictive analytics is about, you know, using history to predict future or some version of that. Um, and I remember, you know, a first meeting as we were rolling out a framework for this in, in talking with a large high tech company and talking to their CHRO and what do you want to predict? And uh, they said, well, we were trying to figure out how to predict attrition and we're trying to uh, have a more predictable talent pipeline to leadership level roles. And that seemed to be those two topics seem to be the hot topics that have persisted in, in the analytics arena. But from what we've seen, so many companies really struggle to crack the nut. And what what I saw was for many of them is it was this excitement about predictive analytics as a set of tools that they wanted to have in their toolbox, but without a clear agenda of what business impact they were trying to bring. And so that's the first the first barrier that, that obviously you guys have seen in the blog is just the idea that there's all this hype about predictive analytics, but it's just a tool or a set of tools. You have to have a problem to solve in order for those tools to actually bear fruit. And so what we see is a huge difference between those companies that apply predictive analytics to specific problems and set out as their HR agenda that we're going to solve these handful of really gnarly business problems through analytics versus those that say, we're going to get really good at analytics without attaching it to a business problem. So that's that's the first one as I see is just the like so many things that go through a hype cycle. There's an excitement about using the tools, maybe buying some technology, maybe hiring a data scientist. And yet there aren't the problems to solve. And the HR business partner population that hopefully would be creating demand for these kind of uh, activities in, in analytics don't yet have the acumen to tease out business problems as analytic problems. So that further compounds it. So I'll pause there, but those those are some of the key themes that I saw coming into it. Yeah, I think, I think something very interesting about that is, um, you know, I th- I bet often when you start a conversation and you're asking somebody really an open ended question about what do you want to predict, what, what are you trying to get to, um, I, I can imagine a lot of blank stare responses. In fact, I know I've seen some of them myself. And so it seems to be there's a little bit of a conundrum that a lot of the technologies are trying to put forward modules or bundles or packets of, you know, of things that they're guessing are the predictive things that, uh, that their clients want to get to. And yet in some ways, doesn't that just hinder the process of really thinking about what you, you Hmm. know, what is, what is it that is going to be the big nut that you want to correct? Right. Right. I think if I'm understanding your question, I think that's a great point to bring out is that when you have vendors, technology providers providing pre-canned analytics, it presupposes the problems to be solved. You know, I think about an early client that we met with um, a a similar kind of problem. They were approaching analytics as a capability to build without a problem to solve. And so we started talking about is, well, what, what is it that you want to analyze that would drive real business results? This was a lawn care nationwide lawn care company. Um, they lay people off in the cooler climates. They lay people off in the winter, rehire them in the summer. They saw that there was some correlation between employee retention during that off season and client retention to sign back up the next year for their lawn care services. Um, and now there's there's a real problem you can go after with analytics. It's super specific to their industry, to their company and the way they staff the work. And, and I think that's what kind of calls out the need for really um, diving in deep on your particular business issues that are certainly industry specific, if not more specific than that to your, to your specific company. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it kind of reminds me a little bit, uh, and I think we've talked about this maybe, Julie, is the, uh, the RPA, um, I would say fad, but a lot of people got involved in RPA and I think they thought, oh, we got to be doing RPA because our peers are doing it. And then 
when you talk to them, it's like, well, what are you, what are you going to solve with this? Right. It's, it's what's the use case that you're going after. And then, oh, you know, they kind of step back. And, and so, yeah, I think it's, you're right. Like having a, a, a something to go solve is, is certainly a key starting point. But, you know, the, the interesting thing that I find in my work is I look at a lot of these products uh, from the buyer side and, and from my side to understand what's, you know, what's being proliferated, how it's, how it's helping buyers. And one of the things that comes about a lot of times with the buyers is they, they stormed off, and maybe you mentioned this a little bit, right? They bought this product, they bought the new bell or the whistle that they thought was going to be the thing. And then they said, well, we didn't really, we didn't really use it well. We, didn't, we, we don't think we're getting out of it what we thought. And what's interesting is, right, we've talked about this, Julie, the Sapient Report this year, analytics was one of the key areas that firms want to replace, which I think like, well, okay. gosh, it, you're, most, many of you are struggling with analytics to begin with. How can you go and think about replacing something you probably aren't even maxing out what you have. So I, I wonder sometimes to your point, if there are a lot of organizations that do that, right? We have to do analytics just like everyone else. They storm off, they buy the thing, they put it in place and they go, Oh, I don't feel very predictive, you know? Yeah. And so uh, I think there is that, that focus of, of really understanding what you're trying to, trying to become. I, right? I think yeah. Some of that is because the, there's a, there's a journey, right? There's a transformation yeah. journey that happens even before you get to pre- predictive analytics. And that is, you know, you're in, a legacy reports environment. And so then you get new tools and it's like, oh, with new tools come new reports, right? So you want to try to leverage that. But then, you know, you also now have tools that focus less on pushing reports and more on dashboards. So, so that's a massive change from, you know, where maybe you're starting or you're trying to get to. And then those dashboards can bring, you know, predictive templates, which we just talked about, which are, you know, presupposing what the issues are. And, and so some folks are going to go through that progression in their journey to get to predictive analytics because the technology is leading them there. And, and yet I think oftentimes leaders are the ones who are saying, no, no, I, I, I want to find the nut. <laughs> when it's all yeah. the nut. And, uh, they and, want the ROI right away. Yeah, they want the ROI, but they also yeah. maybe have particular problems that they're really trying to focus in on. And, and uh, that might not allow for the time to take that, you know, walk, crawl, run, you know, mm, yeah. crawl, whichever order you do those things in, right? To get to, right. you know, to what the leadership is hoping right. uh, to get to. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, one of the things I've seen along those lines is that, um, the way I say it is curiosity dies when it's so hard to do the analytics in the first place, or it's so hard just to pull the data together from multiple sources from across the world, sending out templates, getting data back in. Um, if you're not ready to deliver interesting analytics and reporting on the fly, your business leaders know that. They know that when I ask for data or an analysis, it's going to take you six months and you're going to come back to me with something that has maybe some flaws in the data or other assumptions. And so you're going to back to the drawing boards. And as a leader, they just lose curiosity for this HR stuff. They're like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on analytics more in the finance or logistics or elsewhere um, in, in the business because HR really just can't support our level of curiosity as leaders. And so the curiosity yeah. dies. So I feel yeah, like that's it, where, to your point, Julie, you got to be on yeah. a progression and you got to keep it moving. Do you and think that's meantime, a skill getting... issue though? Do you think that's a skill issue in, in the in the business? Maybe there's just a skills gap in knowing how to do this to some extent? Some, some of it surely yeah. is because it's not, you know, we know that there are a shortage of resources that have that unique combination of curiosity and mm-hmm. analytical ability to be able to do this well. Um, but I also think as they saying with the time lapse there, you know, the leaders are probably getting 20 hunches to use as sources of information while waiting, you know, anything that's fact-based or data-based. And so at a certain point in time, you know, information is coming faster from less complicated sources, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I would say, it's, Pete, and I, I totally agree, there's a skill issue and it's, it's really multifaceted. So there's mm-hmm. a skill issue in that you may or may not have the data expert, the analytical expert that can, you know, run the numbers for you. Um, Your HR population out in the field, I alluded to this earlier, may not have the acumen. They've got all kinds of great HR skills and we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say those HR people without analytical skills can't add value anymore. They suit, they, you know, surely can through all of the other great things they do, facilitation and talent brokering and assessment, those kinds of things. But analytics isn't their specialty. And yet we're relying on them to 
take business conversations and translate them into analytical questions. So there's a skill gap yeah. um, out there in the field too. And then there's this, just the core muscle memory of, uh, of data management. And that's where that's, you know, all the excitement for analytics falls flat. The first conversation where an executive says, time out, what's the denominator there? And where'd you get that number? And that data is out of date. And all of a sudden, all yeah. the great analysis you've yep. done falls flat because, oh, yeah. you know, so I think there's, there's a lot of skill, different skill sets um, embedded here. Yeah. For anyone I, curious enough to find the blog, like this is your, this is, this is your third bullet, right, Dave, which is, yeah. you know, data management it equals nerd dumb. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> there, there's some truth in that, right? Yeah. yeah. But you know, back to the skills thing and, and to what you're saying, I mean, I think the frontline manager, right. We're asking a lot of them today when it comes to being just on the front lines of doing their job, but then also having to be an HR person in, in a lot of ways, having to be career coach, life coach, all these other things. And now, oh, by the way, we need you to be a data scientist also. Um, do you think that the products that are out there, Dave, like are setting these managers up to actually be successful? Or do you think it's too much, not enough? Like, what are your thoughts just from what you've seen? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've talked to, um, um, I'll, I'll use an example. So Vizier is a great tool, and yeah. this is not a critique of it as a tool. Um, yeah, yeah. But what I've seen from talking to Vizier clients as an example, and it's an example that I see across other technologies similarly, is that you get a handful of people that are excited about it mm -hmm. and they're leveraging the crap out of it and, and providing great analytics for the small handful of clients that they have. But it's that mass of other HR folks or man or line managers who have access to that data, but just don't have the the skills to yeah. either use the tools you've given them, or it's less about being able to use the tools. It's more about being able to like look at a chart and a graph and tell themselves a story based on mm. that, that they can yes. go act on. Yeah. So, so I feel like those tools are great, but what I've heard from clients that use them is that the challenge is still there to go from a core tight cadre of folks that love the data to the masses of either HR or line managers to leverage it to become more analytical in their general thinking. It's yeah. just it's a it's a bridge that just doesn't um nobody's figured out how to build it. Yeah. Yeah. Are you referring to the what to do about it sort of part in that case? Um it's really both. I feel like there's there's some skills around analytics that maybe aren't fully unpacked yet. Yeah. And it's around taking somebody whose mind works a certain way, who who focuses on certain aspects mm -hmm. of their role as an HR leader, and you're really asking their brain to work a little bit differently, right? Right. Turn a little bit differently, and I think that's that's where um, the gap is, especially because we're all busy. And so, taking the time to slow down and really retool yourself, which of course everybody's challenged to do right now, um, is um, is tough. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. I, sorry. Go ahead, Julie. Well, I think also gets to the idea that oftentimes we're expecting to find those types of skills in other parts of the organization that are not HR. And so, you know, I do see a number of times where HR is um, is almost happy to say, oh, yeah, and then pass that to the BI or to the data yeah. lakes or let somebody else figure out how to do that. And um, what I'm seeing more and more is some pushback from a data security and data privacy perspective, mm, because good. the types of information that are incumbent in uh, in HR analytics in particular and people analytics um, do have elements of PNII and other sorts oh, yeah. of people related prospects. And so, so um, where HR is extremely favorable and wants to dig in and enable itself, I usually find uh, folks that are, uh, that are very in tune with the fact that um, these uh, HR technology and tools are built with, PII and, and data privacy and security issues in mind that are less important in other back office functions, right? Yeah, understood, understood. So true. Yeah, you know, Dave, there was a, a sec the, the second barrier that you put that put up was the be careful what you look for. And I, I, that's the one, this is the one area I wanted to talk about my, myself. So tell me what you, what you meant by that and what, how do you prevent that? Yeah, well, I mean, not prevent it because you're going to be you're going to be looking for things. But how do you prevent maybe stepping in a hole, I guess? Yeah, uh, well, as you go, I, I think the thing is, when you go to root cause a problem, you don't know what root cause you're going to find. Mm -hmm. And depending upon what you're you find, there's a whole set of diverse 
uh, interventions it's going to take to solve the problem you find. And so, um, and, and some of them require really tough cultural changes or mm-hmm. making some serious uh, shifts in how you think about leadership and turning over leaders that aren't, uh, you know, living up to new expectations and, and whatnot. And um, there's a, a lot of pressure once you've found a problem. Yeah. <laughs> to, to have all the skills you need, which yeah. are diverse, in order to yeah. solve it. So, you know, like, talk about, what's that? <laughs> and the authority. <laughs> and the authority, yeah. So, you know, if you're looking at attrition and you're figuring out where you have pockets of a higher levels of attrition in your organization, and you're able to attribute some of that to a style of leadership, you know, through exit interviews or engagement surveys or whatnot, pulse checks, and you realize, okay, I have an attrition issue that's focused on maybe particular a particular segment of the workforce or a particular part of the organization, are you willing to turn over leaders if that's part of the problem in order to, to solve it? Or do you have the, um, the patience to change culture, you know, a three to five year culture change journey? Like that's, that's what you find at the root of some of the analytics that you're going to do. Um, and these are intractable problems that are not uh, that aren't easy and they require really the whole talent cycle yeah. in order to gradually evolve. So depending upon what type of analysis you're looking at, um, you can, you can find yourself root causing to really tough problems to solve that are going to call upon. And I think this is the other aspect of it is you're calling upon a really, uh, you're calling upon HR to come in and deliver in a whole bunch of different ways to shift the culture or to, to break your glass ceilings or whatever it is that you've root caused. And that means you gotta be firing on all cylinders. You gotta be able to change culture. You gotta be able to change your technology. You gotta be able to, um, you know, do the data management stuff, um, change your talent processes, all those kinds of things. It sounds like change management comes along with finding out some of these, some of these, uh, revelations, I guess, maybe, maybe not yeah. revelations, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it, you're right. It, be careful what you look for, right? You, you're going to go find a problem. You're going to find a problem and you're going to need to fix it. So do, do yeah. you think that that, again, the skills, right? Like, do you think this is another area where analytics comes with more than just data? It's, it's change. It's hopefully, hopefully it's positive change, but do you think that that's, it's part of this as you're designing your organization? Do you think underpinning that with change management and other elements of the, of the, of the org is required to then kind of mature you if you're going to be a very predictive HR organization? Absolutely. Because you have to be able to solve whatever problem you find, right? Act upon it, right? Yeah. And so if you have a, you know, if if you have um, a narrow, uh, if you've got a a bottleneck in your candidate (laughs) funnel, you got to be able to have the acumen in your talent acquisition team to go, you know, increase the aperture of your funnel in the particular segment of the workforce that you're looking for, that may require technology, that may require more creative social media marketing of open jobs. And so, um, so yeah, there's, there's skills you need to bring with it. I think the other thing that helps though, is when you tackle analytics, at least some of your analytics as real significant projects, you say, I'm going to scope a project. We're going to go work with a key set of business stakeholders who have the authority to make the changes that we may need them to make. Um, and, uh, and that we can have an analytics team stick with it. So we're not just pushing this out in standard reports and analytics to an HR person who may or may not have those anal- analytical skills. We've got a SWAT team that does have the combination of change management, analytical, and everything else so they can deploy, stick with it, and, and really resolve some of the, the problems we find. Yeah, I just, foundationally, I think it's it, it's unique to hear a leader that speaks to analytics and the desire for analytics from that perspective, right? I mean, that's a very advanced mm-hmm. view um, of of the reason for and the calling to bring people analytics into the picture. I think more often than not, which is probably part of why there are these barriers and folks don't advance, you know, in um, in ways that they think they should more often than not when it, when folks begin a people analytics conversation they want reports and yeah. dashboards and yeah they just want data at their fingertips and they're they're maybe uh, the thinking is well that will help me identify what the conversation is that I should even be having or asking mm-hmm. to be having. yeah yeah do, do you think this is uh that that analytics right just predictive in general right it, do you think it's something that a small business sh- 
can do. I mean, obviously the power of the data that they have is, is much different. Um, nowadays we have a lot of benchmarking tools coming into the marketplace where even the smaller firms can get access to nice benchmarks and, and things like that. But do you think mm -hmm. this is something that the small mid market firm can do as well as the big company, or is this really just a big company solution? Well, I think there's two, two things I'd say one and is, it, yeah, is there a different way to approach it? I guess in each. Yeah. Each. I mean, we're talking about predictive analytics. As I mentioned earlier in my career, I was, and, and still, I'm amazed at what you can do by just good visualization yeah. of current state numbers and the target that you're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it's easy with the hype around something new like predictive analytics, machine learning, all this stuff, to start discounting the value of what you can do with basic metrics and dashboards and, and simple pie charts that can that can actually show trends or can show which populations are different than other populations. So I should go focus here versus there. So I think there's a ton you can learn about your populations or about your business processes um, through more basic measures than than predictive analytics. The challenge with predictive analytics is that it requires a lot of data or machine mm -hmm. learning, right? You, you, yep. you need a, a big data set. And so if you have a few hundred or a couple thousand employees um, you know, you, you, it can be limiting in terms of what kind of predictive analytics you can do. But I would say then your focus can be more on visualizing a current state and a trend over time and watching how it moves and, and, and acting on it that way. It, not yeah. everything, again, it's, it's like not everything needs predictive analytics. Not everything needs right. to be a factor analysis question. Not everything needs to be, you know, regression analysis. There's a lot of basic math that can be informative. Yeah. Yeah. And the emotional intelligence part, I, I think can't be understated, right? Like I, you know, I, I, I've studied the predictive stuff, all the new tools. It's really neat. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things, but like you think about things like, um, you know, flight risk and things like that, it kind of gets a little dicey. Like, you know, is the data right that they may or may not leave? You may accuse them of something that's not, you know, it just opens a whole can right. of worms. So you know, along that lines of, of predictive, right? How much of it do you have to balance reality with what you're seeing versus, you know, maybe some biases that might've slipped in somehow? I don't know, but um, any thoughts on that, Dave? Like, how do you, how do you prevent that stuff? Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, where I'm really curious and I, I'm not an expert in this area, but I'm curious those models that predict, you know, mm -hmm. hey, Pete's probably going to quit if our, you know, based on yeah. everybody else that <laughs> looks or sounds or has role, has a job history like Pete, yep. uh, he's likely to quit in the next two months unless you fill in the blank, right, with the, the prescriptive. Because from predictive, we were all supposed to go to prescriptive. That was the holy grail. Um, and so we were going to prescribe that Pete needs a promotion or he should do a cross-functional yeah. project or he should get a, a salary <laughs> increase. Um I'm I, I'm not familiar on this with deeply with the science on that, but I'm I'm skeptical in that if if Pete's not having a great experience and is likely to leave, um, you know, throwing something at him is probably not gonna uh, a, a, some new benefit yeah. is not necessarily gonna retain him. It's probably yeah. our it's bigger than one thing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, it's hard. To, it's also hard to isolate market effects, right? We're in such a volatile time right now. True. Um, how do you isolate? The, the market effects, both macro job market, but also the micro job markets of your geographic areas where you operate, or if it's remote workers, the particular skill set they're bringing to the table. There's, there's just so much to control for. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So, you know, there was another part that you talked about. I, I, I took away uh, that, you know, basics, right. Getting the blocking and tackling, right. And not maybe swinging for the fences, so to speak, pardon my baseball analogy here. But but I think that's true in most things. But talk about that a little bit because I thought that was interesting. You talked about you know the, you know, the case for getting the basics right first yeah. um, being important here. Well, I mean, there's a couple of angles to it. One is you can say you know let's crawl, walk, run, right? Let's yeah. make sure that we've got first of all good quality data. And I don't think I know we've talked about that briefly before. But this asset that HR holds and curates is increasing in value the more integrated it becomes within the HR suite of tools, but also as it becomes more proliferated across the other tools, technologies of your, uh, of your enterprise. So there's this core data asset to curate and, and maintain over time. Um, and then upon that, you can, you know, just getting the basics of reporting and, and, um, and visualization, right. There's a ton of value. I, I think back to 
a presentation that me and a colleague made early. This is early in my career in the GE days. And we, we were GE lighting the tiniest shave of margin <laughs> on our products, right? Light oh, yeah. bulbs that we were selling millions of a day versus GE Capital and these other businesses were higher profit. And we're coming in with these cool Excel tools we built to manage the performance management cycle. And it turned out what we had added a ton of value, was super easy to use and gave business leaders the information they needed with basic Excel calculations and visualization. So I'm a big fan of using the basics to sell this, tell the stories you need to tell with the basics, and then really picking the tough problems to point the higher level analytics toward. But just because you don't have either the scale or the capability to do predictive analytics, regression analysis, factor analysis, all these lofty um, you know, machine learning sort of things, um, doesn't mean you can't get a ton of insight from your data and have it and provide it in a super engaging way. So throw that out there. Yeah, yeah. Any thoughts on that, Julie? No, but um, not in that particular area, but I, I am interested before we leave uh, uh, today to ask Dave a little bit about, um, about kind of the technology and tools uh, versus what else you need to kind of um, create a holistic, um, you know, a, approach to people analytics and, and kind of expectations of the buy and, and um, mm. you know, whether you see folks going into it, looking just for, for something narrower than what they need, or, you know, are they, are they looking for and articulating their needs in a way to set them up to, um, to begin to create the foundation for people analytics? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, we talked to a lot of clients and um, Julie, you and I too, I'm sure Pete, you do that, that, have they're about a year after an implementation of some new technology and they're kind of scratching their head. Like I thought I was going to get yep. all these great <laughs> analytics out of, you know, fill in the blank with, you know, their big new technology. Um, and um, I think it goes to a lot of it goes to just expectation setting. Um, but um, as far as the technology is concerned, I think that the basic reporting is going to be there in whatever big platform you have. Leverage that to the extent you can. Engage yourself in the user communities of the application that you've licensed. But um, I, I'm also a big fan of allowing your super techie analytics folks to use the tool they're choosing. Um, so if somebody likes R, let them use R. If somebody likes Python, let them use Python, because that's not going to be the end user tools um, that folks are engaging with. Um, we do see, a, a, you know, a fair amount of um, I don't want to overstate this, but disappointment with, you know, I purchased this tool and uh, it's not bringing the value. It probably is bringing the value for the core. It's the same stuff we've been talking about to the core set of folks that are using it every day, but to the broader population, it's just hard to get adoption. And we just don't see a ton of adoption in the broader population with the more sophisticated tools. I don't know yeah. if that answered your question, Julie. Yeah, well, and I have to say, too, I think it's some of it is around when you're buying or acquiring the tools. So, you know, if you're if you're a first generation HR cloud buyer, you know, I guarantee you right now every salesman out there is putting, you know, one or more, you know, analytics named modules in front of you and, um, you know, playing to the idea that, um, you know, yes, you're expecting to get to a new place, right? In reporting and analytics and dashboard and capabilities and just basic knowledge. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the push is now to buy and incorporate those modules. And in reality, you might even ask an integrator to, you know, to go ahead and price them and tell, and tell them when you want them deployed by, but, you, you know, you're, you mostly you're not really sure exactly what you're trying to get to and what you need them for yeah. <laughs> at that moment, because you're, you're not true. even new in your new environment yet. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, in a certain, in certain respects, I feel like, you know, our, our excitement to get to that pushes us to create a situation for ourselves where we might have tools or purchase things that ultimately are not what we need or, we never get to them. And, um, and then that becomes, you know, a strike against us. And, right. um, and maybe that's why in like the Sapien Insights research, we see such a high number of folks saying they're, they need to change. They want to change or get to, yeah. or, or, or do something, procure something meaningful in analytics might mean they, maybe they already have something, but honestly, yeah. they bought it too fast. They didn't even know what the heck they needed. Right. right. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's an interesting angle here, which is that, you know, if you're, if you're looking for technology for a specific purpose, you want org view because you're doing a major reorganization and you're, so you're going to use, um, you know, a tool like org view. And I'm not advocating that one in particular, but that category where that allows you to do modeling of org structures and whatnot. Great. Buy the tool for that job. Um, as it relates to your more general reporting and analytics, um, one advice I would piece of advice I'd throw out there is don't end up out on an island. If your HR, if your IT team already support, supports Tableau or some other tool, Power BI, whatever else, um, there's value in uh, going with the tool that's already been adopted in your organization by finance, IT, and whoever else. Um, the capabilities are going to be there. You might get some crossover talent coming into HR because they're great with the tool and they've always wanted to try it out on HR stuff. Um, and, uh, and as it relates to integration and other things, you just, you've got the buy-in there when I've, I, I've had this struggle myself and I've seen others struggle with it. When HR gets excited about a tool that's, uh, that's separate from what's being supported, then <laughs> you're going to have to bring in all the expertise or hire oh, consultants yeah. every time you want to change it. There's, there's huge value in going with whatever data warehousing or visualization tools IT is already supporting. Yeah. That's a great point. Don't go at it alone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask you that earlier if I how much IT has to play a role in in what you do. Um and I would say that most of your HCMs will tell you they don't need to do a lot of lot of work for you, but you're right. I think I've seen that in myself where an organization has that brand already embedded, it tends you tend to get a lot lot smoother work uh, yeah. out of it. So Yeah, let's yeah, be no, realistic, right? When you get <laughs> when you get those higher levels and and meaningful, you know, analytics to solve certain questions, you know, there, there is a number, there's some intersectionality that happens with finance data, for example, mm -hmm. and so, or planning data or budget data. And so, um, you know, so there, there's a lot of, we aren't an island, um, although we'd like to solve our own, our own data challenges first, so yeah. that we feel like we have a good foundation, but. Well, there's so much more power when you can bring that data together with right. business data and operations data, finance data, and really have a view, a, a full view of what's going on in the organization. Um, and that's the, you know, that's where you can get that agility everyone's hoping for and predictive, predictive insights yeah, uh, to right. help you along. So, yeah. so Dave, any, anything else you would, uh, you would offer as lessons learned or, or, uh, just takeaways anyone should, should know about going off on the analytics in, analytics journey? You know, I, I think we've like covered it. Make sure you got yeah. the basics, um, make sure you know why you're doing it. Um, don't oversell how much everybody's going to adopt it until you see how much everybody does adopt it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, make sure under underlying it all, it's, uh, it's good data. I mean, that's, that, that's where, that's where you can lose the most ground is if there isn't good data to analyze, then um, it's all lost. I think there's, there's some really interesting hype that we'll, we'll probably, Julie and I'll probably cover in, in one of our upcoming podcasts or blogs, which is around awesome. this whole skills thing. Yeah. I think that's an interesting area to follow. And again, to not make ex assumptions about how much, your experience is going to align with the hype. Um, skills is a new area with some new science and um, probably hard to draw conclusions from right now. So I think that's an area that I'm curious to follow. Yeah. And I would say, let's all watch the hype with, on the one hand, optimism and excitement. On the other hand, a little bit of skepticism around um, how it's all going to play out. And we'll, we'll have more to come on that. Yeah, well, we would absolutely love to have you back on to talk about it. Julie and I are always looking for conversations, as you can tell. So <laughs> anytime, you're welcome. You're welcome. Awesome. So where can folks connect with you, Dave? I know, I know I'll make sure that everyone gets uh, your blog link in our in our description here on the episode, but where can we? Where can folks find you at? Yeah, fi I mean, definitely find us on LinkedIn. Heron Palmer is, is online as well on LinkedIn and, and uh, with our website, so you can definitely find us there, and we're, we're here to help. Yeah. Awesome. If you haven't checked out the blog, be sure and check it out. I, I know I posted it on LinkedIn. Julie and I have both shared it. It's on the HR and payroll 2.0 uh, LinkedIn site, and I'll make sure that it's in the description for today. And, and this has been great. Thank you so much, Dave, for joining us. We really appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Great chat. Yeah. You.